Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, a channel where we are passionate about the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Today we are jumping back into our series, Life in the Word, a weekly Bible study that we do here on this channel where we seek to explore and unpack books of the Bible one chapter at a time. This week we're continuing through the book of John and we find ourselves in John chapter 15. It has been a great journey going through the book of John and we're starting to get towards the end. If you're new, I'd encourage you at some point, maybe go back and listen to some of the earlier ones to get a sense of where we're at and how we've gotten here. But if you are new, I just want to say welcome and thank you so much for being here. As we're getting ready to dive into it, I'd encourage you to grab a Bible, whether that's in digital form on a glowing screen or in paper form, whatever floats your boat. But as you're doing that, I just want to say a real quick thank you so much to our patron subscribers and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially to my monthly patrons who, through their generosity, give to this channel every single month to not only keep it sustainable, but allow it to grow into exciting and new things and further the mission of gospel simplicity. Thank you all so much. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can do so using the link in the description. Well, anyway, as you're grabbing your Bible, go ahead and turn there, and I'd encourage you to pause the video and go ahead and read the chapter. I say this every week, but you will get so much more out of this if you take the time to do that because, well, you'll actually know what we're talking about. And let's be honest, it, it never hurts to get some Bible reading. And so go ahead and do that, and we will be right back. Well, hey guys, now that you've done that, or maybe did that, we will go ahead and jump into this. And where I always like to start when we're studying a passage of scripture, and for those of you that listen every week, you know this, you might even be tempted to hit skip forward a little bit, but, 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 you know that we always want to be paying attention to the context, because a verse without context is in danger of becoming a pretext. And why is this so important? Well, we're saying that the Bible has serious authority and we want to interpret it rightly. We don't want to take verses out of context because people will hear, perhaps other Christians will hear you say that this comes from scripture and they're going to think, oh, like I really need to pay attention to this. And I would hate for you to be leading people astray because you didn't pay attention to the context. Now we've gone over a lot of the context of the book of John. We've covered a lot of the historical cultural context, which is oh so important because reading the Bible is a cross-cultural experience and we have to get on those lenses that allow us to look back and understand how the original audience would have understood it. But we're not going to go back over all that because we've done it and if you want to learn more about that, you can maybe check out week one or other weeks in this series. And we've also talked about the literary context quite at length about how the book of John is divided up into different units and how in chapters about one through 12, we see Jesus's ministry to the people and we see his work, him working all these miracles and making the case that he is the Christ, the son of God, which is the, the purpose of John writing this. He, he tells us that at the end of the book. And so when we're reading in light of the historical context, when we're reading in light of the purpose and the plan, the literary context, what, why the author's writing and how he's written, we find that, okay, he's making this case about Jesus. And now we have gotten into the second half of the book where he really slows things down and it zeroes in on the moments leading up to Jesus's crucifixion. Specifically in the past couple chapters, we've been looking at some of Jesus's final moments with his disciples before he goes to the cross, this climactic moment in the story of Jesus. And this is where the narration of the story slows down and you get this intimate picture of Jesus with his disciples giving these final instructions and teachings and preparing them for what is to come. Now today, Jesus starts us off with this beautiful image and Jesus so often taught in parables and in short stories and his teachings have been so accessible to so many for, well, for many reasons. But I think one of the reasons that there's been such an enduring fascination with the teachings of Jesus, even among those who don't follow Jesus, they, they still know the stories of the Good Samaritan, is because of the way he taught. He taught using these vivid pictures and these characters that come to life in story. And there's probably a lot we could talk about just in that, but today's not a day to analyze modes of communication. But I do want to start off our discussion today with some words from St. Augustine on this initial image that Jesus gives us, and that is of the vine and the branches and, and the father as the vine dresser. It is a really incredible picture of what it is to follow Jesus and to abide in his love. But Augustine start, starts us off with this. He says, 
This passage of the gospel, brethren, where the Lord calls himself the vine and his disciples the branches, declares in so many words that the mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, is the head of the church, and that we are his members. For as the vine and its branches are of one nature, therefore his own nature as being God, being different from ours, he became man, that in him human nature might be the vine, and we who are also men might become branches thereof. Now, I love, and we see this inclination in the patristic writings, which are the writings of the church fathers, these saints of old that wrote on scripture and the life of faith, and Augustine being one of them. And what we often see is them rooting their teaching in two primary things. They're grounding all of their theology in the Trinity and in the Incarnation. This is the, the center, the spoke, of the, the hub of the wheel from which the spokes come forth. All of our theology is ultimately traced back to these profound mystery, mysteries of the Christian faith. And what we see here is Augustine saying that, you see in this image that Jesus gives us of the vine and the branches, where we are of one nature with that, where the, the vine and the branches are of that same nature, well, that was only possible because of the incarnation, because Jesus took on flesh to become one with us. That is ground zero of salvation, is that taking on of a human nature by God, which is the greatest gift of grace that the human nature has ever and will ever receive. And I thought that was just a really great way to start this off. But as we begin to go through John chapter 15 and look at this image, there's a few things I want to tease out. There is this idea that Jesus is the, the vine and that we are the branches, that we have this great connection with him, this intimacy, this union that we could say. And this is something that John's been teasing out and we've been looking at a lot. That just as Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in him, we too are in Jesus and participate in that very life of God, which is the is absolutely astounding and is one of the central motifs of the book of John, specifically in this section. And I think extended reflection on that can be so fruitful for our lives in Christ. And I would really encourage you to continue thinking about that. But there's this really interesting dynamic that goes on here, and it is around the idea of bearing fruit. And we see this idea often throughout the Gospels and the New Testament. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and that Jesus talks about you can judge a person by his fruits, and that these fruits are labeled as these actions, the, the things that pour forth from us. And just as a tree is going to bear fruit in accord with its nature, well, we can see what people are really like by what they do is what Jesus is getting at. You want to know if it's a good tree? We'll see what kind of fruit it produces. If you want to know it's a good person, look at their deeds. And of course, there's qualifications there, but that is the central idea here. And he says that every branch in him that does, he does not bear fruit, that the father who is the vine dresser, he takes away. And these are serious words that you could be in the vine, but then you are taken out because you're not bearing fruit. Now, we're not going to go too far on that route of perseverance and apostatizing and all these things. There's great reflection to be had there, but it's just a little beyond the scope of where we're going to go today. But then he goes on that every branch that does bear fruit, the father prunes. And, and he makes this interesting play on words here where he goes on and says, already you are clean speaking to the disciples because I have sp because of the word that I've spoken to you. Now, there's a lot going on here. There's this dynamic that we are in Christ, but yet we need to bear fruit. Now, we don't want to push these parables too far because they, they are parables. They're, they're stories. They're not always giving us each and every detail, but there is something to be said that we are in Christ and then we bear fruit and that that determines the validity of our our nature and who we are and that, that we are judged by those things, but we we don't bear fruit and then become in the vine. We are in the vine. We are justified in Christ. And then that leads to good fruit. But if we're not bearing fruit, well, the father, the vine dresser takes the, the right to be able to remove that branch. But even if we do bear fruit, he prunes us. And then he talks about the disciples about being clean. Well, John is really fond of wordplay, and it's easy to miss in English because, well, it doesn't always work out trying to translate wordplay. But these actually come from the same Greek word, this idea of pruning and cleaning. And so we can have this same motif that we see throughout John, that the Father cleanses us, and we see this in many places throughout the book. And so even though pruning is this difficult thing, I mean, if you're familiar with it, it's cutting back branches. That's a painful thing. And sometimes we face painful things in our walk with Christ, but it's actually for 
are good. And man, as I look back at 2020 and the start of 2021, which hasn't been any better, I, I see perhaps a lot of pruning going on. And I don't say that to make light of the difficult things that we've gone through and that so many of you have experienced. I don't want to downplay at all the pain that you felt. But we do see in scripture this idea that often that, that we count it joy, my dear brothers, as James says, when you face trials and persecutions of various kinds, for it produces steadfastness in your faith. Well, in the same idea that we are pruned the, so that we might bear more fruit. Now, if we don't have this eternal perspective that, you know, if we are only thinking about this life, pruning or tr sending trials our way, that might seem cruel of God. But if we actually adopt an eternal perspective, we were thinking in light of living eternally with God and we see that our relationship with God is the most important thing in our lives. Well, then we can see that these things actually are for our good because they do produce these the steadfastness of faith in us, even if it's temporally difficult. And so I think this is a really important thing that we see in this initial section here. But then there is this idea that comes up a couple times in here of abiding in Christ. And now that's not a word that I would often hear. I, I'm not sure how often you tell someone, hey, abide in me. It, it might seem strange to you. And when you read that, well, you might have had a question or you might have been tempted to just gloss over it. And just as a quick point for when you're reading scripture, one of the best things you can do, one of the best ways to get more out of your Bible study is to ask more questions. In fact, I once made a whole video on this in a series about how to read the Bible. And this is so important. Don't just skim over things you don't understand or places that you don't know the name of or all these things. Actually take the time to ask the questions. It'll take you longer to read, but you'll get a lot more out of it. And today we have so many great resources to help you answer those questions. So many free resources that you can use. In fact, you could look up this word abide and find out that what it's getting at is to, to make your home in this place. Almost the, the sense of, you know, there's Old Testament allusions here of God dwelling with his people, tabernacling with them. You could almost translate it that way. And so we see this idea of, hey, make your home in Jesus. And now that's a beautiful picture. And it'd be easy to sentimentalize that. And there are aspects of that which are intimate and dear, for sure, that Jesus invites us to make our home with him. And later on, we're going to see him call us friends. Certainly, there are beautiful sentiments here. But he does go on to define a little bit of what abiding looks like. And this is one of those chapters where you have to let it unfold, because as you let it unfold, you'll see what it means. And again, it illustrates the importance of reading the whole movement of thought. You know, often we're tempted to read just a couple verses, and I get that, and sometimes that can be helpful because you can really think deeply about it, but you want to see, you want to be reading in light of the literary context, and that means looking at the whole movement of thought, and where does this thought occur in the wider movement, this section, and where does this section occur in light of this book, and where does this book occur in light of the story of salvation? And here, if you take the time to really read this full chapter, you begin to see what is meant by this. Because if you're not sure what abiding in him looks like, he goes on to talk about abide in his love in verse 9. And then in verse 10, he clarifies, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And so certainly we, we can sentimentalize this a bit, but really what does it mean to abide in the love of Jesus? What does it mean to abide in him? It means to keep his commandments. And that might seem like a letdown to you. It might be like, ah, like that won't preach as well. That's not as exciting. But it's not like these commandments are arbitrary. God is giving us these commandments so that we can experience the joy of life with him, so that we can be that vine attached, to, so that we can be that branch rather attached to the vine, so that we can experience that intimate union with Jesus, which is in a sense, just like the union that Jesus has with the Father, because we are invited into that very life, which again, we see all throughout here. He says, you know, if you abide in me, then you'll keep my commandments. And then he goes on, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. There's this parallel, parallelism that we see constantly throughout the book of John. But before we jump too far there, I want to look at this idea of the fact that we cannot bear fruit apart from Jesus, because this is so important. Earlier, I talked about that idea that it's not that we bear fruit and then become a branch. No, we bear fruit because we are a branch connected to the vine. It is only because of Jesus, only ever because of him, that we bear fruit. This, this is so important, and this really can't be overstated. He, he says, Augustine, commenting on this chapter, says this, For the relation of the branches to the vine is such that they contribute nothing to the vine, but from it derive their own means of life. 
Well, that of the vine to the branches is that is such that it supplies their vital nourishment and receives nothing from them. This is such a powerful thing about our relationship with God. He doesn't need us. So often we talk about doing good things for God as though he's in need of us and he's really strapped if, if we don't come help him out. But I just want to allow you for a moment to think about the utter ridiculousness of, of such an idea. Now, yes, in, in God's great mercy and his great love, he allows us to partner with him in what he is doing in the world. But let's be clear. God's fine without you. God's fine without me. But it is out of his love that he comes to us and actually unites himself to us in love. But, but it's not because he has to. He's under no compulsion to do so. And this image of the vine and the branches, it shows us that, that we have no life apart from God. We can't do anything apart from him. Augustine goes on to show this in further ways, which are really important. He says, why your assertion that man of himself worketh righteousness, that is the height of your self elation. He's going on in this dialogue and saying, if you think that we can do good things apart from Jesus, if you think that we can earn our salvation in this way apart from the grace of God, you're out of your mind. That's the height of your self elation in a more Augustinian sense. He goes on, for whoever imagines that he is bearing fruit of himself is not in the vine. He that is not in the vine is not in Christ. And he that is not in Christ is not a Christian. Let's be clear here. It is only by the grace of God that we are counted as righteous. It is only by the grace of God that we can grow in righteousness. It is only by the grace of God that we can do truly good things. And now that, of course, needs qualification. Are you saying an atheist can't do good things at all? No, of course. In fact, some of your atheist neighbors they might be a lot nicer than you. They might be nicer than me. But, but to do a true good work, to truly love God selflessly, the, the highest good, which is to love God. Well, we can only do that insofar as we recognize that we can't do it on our own, that God grants us this. And it is by grace and grace alone that we are where we are in Christ. We do not become Christians. We, are, we do not become branches by our own might of just trying to branch it up. No, it is because of the life of the vine that nourishes us that we could ever be counted as branches. As I said, this chapter really just continues to unfold and give more and more. So we see this idea that we are the branches, he is the vine, and that we must abide in him. But what does it mean to abide in him? Well, it means to love him. And what does it mean to love him? Well, it means to keep the commandments. And then he goes on, what really is love? Well, even this gets defined. He says, John tells us in verse 12, that in, in the words of Jesus, uh, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus makes it clear. This is what love is. He raises the bar. And we've talked about this elsewhere. Jesus gives this radical new commandment in John 13, that as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Not just love as you think love is due to someone, not even just love as, as you'd like to be loved, but love as Jesus has loved. And in light of what's happening in this book, that he's about to go to his death on a cross for them, well, that's a radical type of love. And he even shows it. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And now, as astounding as that would have been, and as wonderful sounding as it would have been, imagine then thinking back on this as a disciple. That's what Jesus meant. After the crucifixion going, you know, Jesus had said, greater love has no one than this, they lay down his life for his friends. But, but what was he talking about? He was talking about his death on a cross. But you might ask friends, how, how does that tie in? Well, he continues to unpack this, and it's so good. The next thing I want to talk about is this idea of friendship, because Jesus clarifies and makes it clear that he's pointing towards his own death. He's actually talking about dying for the very people he's speaking to, his disciples. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, this is astounding because throughout the book of John, we've seen that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God in whom we have life. In the Old Testament, only two people are called friends of God, Moses and Abraham. And now Jesus, who is in himself God, is telling his disciples that he is calling them friends. And in fact, all who keep his commands are his friends. We get invited into this class of people that was only defined by Moses and Abraham, arguably the two greatest people of the Old Testament, the, the one whom God chooses to make a father of many nations, and then the one whom has a special relationship 
with God leading his people out of Egypt into the promised land, Moses. This is absolutely incredible. And it points towards the new thing that Jesus is doing, inviting people in to this radical new relationship with God that is a continuation of what had happened, but is bringing it into this new era in a profound way. He's inviting you to be called a friend of God. And now today it's easy to lose sight of how absolutely incredible this is. We think that God, for whatever reason, owes us friendship because we really think we're that great. And again, think about that for like two seconds. The God of the universe who created all things owes you something? No, of course not. And if you think about yourself, as great as you are in many ways, I'm sure, you probably don't deserve to be called a friend of God. Of course, it's only by the grace of God that we could ever receive such an incredible title as friend of God. And if we map that onto what we just saw, it's a friend of God. Jesus laid down his life for you. He laid down his life for the world that they may all come to know him. That is absolutely incredible. That is the story of the gospel. That is why the gospel never failed to be good news. That the God who created the world loved you enough to enter into the world, to become one with humanity, one with you, and die for you, that you might participate in that death so that you might participate in his new life. That is astounding, and it's a simply incredible truth. Ambrose, in a really interesting letter on the duties of the clergy, talks about this idea of friendship, and he expands on it at length. But he alludes to this verse, and he talks about the fact that Jesus gave us a pattern of friendship to follow. In his words, we are to fulfill the wish of a friend, to unfold to him our secrets which we hold in our hearts, and are not to disregard his confidences. Let us show him in our heart, and he will open his to us. That's absolutely beautiful. And it's the pattern we're to follow. The way in which Jesus loved us is how we are to love him. And of course, we will fall short of that. But in his grace, he has space for that. But what he asks of us is what he did just then in showing them that he was their friend. He says, "You are. I call you friend because I now tell you what I'm doing. I don't keep secrets from you. Well, and in return, we don't keep secrets from God. We come to him in prayer, lay bare our soul before him, for he already knows your thoughts, he knows your heart. But we have a true friendship with God. And that is the gift of prayer. That is the gift of knowing God. And man, how often do we take that for granted? And I, I pray that I wouldn't do that as often. I pray that you wouldn't either. Now, there's a final section in this that I want to talk about. And I talked about the fact that in being united to Christ, we actually die with him, participate in his death, and are raised to life with him. We get this idea in Romans 6, I believe it's like 3 to 5 there, but we see it throughout Paul, this motif of being in Christ, and certainly throughout John. We've been looking at it. Hopefully, you've been seeing some of that. But it's not all just about the, the joys of that. There's also the fact that we participate in the sufferings of Christ. Now, we do count that as a joy, but it won't be necessarily a fun one. In this final section, Jesus talks about the hatred of the world. He says, the world hated me, and insofar as you are united to me, insofar as you are following me, well, it's going to hate you too, not on account of you. Don't think you're that special. It's because of me, he says. But likewise, when, when they listen to me, they'll listen to you. We are truly united to Christ. He allows us to partner with him in his mission to such an extent that, that we are his ambassadors, that in rejecting him, they will also reject us. But in accepting us, they will also be accepting him. And again, is this because we're so special? No, it's because he's so great and allows us to participate in that. And that's scary. This idea that if the world hated him, they're going to hate us. Because, well, you do remember what the hatred of him looked like. I hate to spoil the end of the book, but it ends in Jesus showing that great love, that greater than there is no other of laying down his life for his friends. It ends him being crucified on a Roman cross, mocked, beaten, and scorned, stripped naked, and made a laughing stock. That was the climactic moment of Jesus' ministry, of course, before the resurrection. He's saying, hey, if they hated you, if they hated me, they'll hate you in the same way. And now it doesn't mean necessarily you're going to be hung on a Roman cross. Here that empire died a while ago. But it does mean we can't expect difficulty, that following Jesus won't always be easy. But again, if we have that eternal perspective, we can see that what greater honor is there than to suffer on behalf of the one 
who suffered all for us to participate in that suffering. And the witness of the early church on this is incredible. I'd really encourage you to read the letters of Ignatius, maybe specifically the letter to the church in Rome. Ignatius was a first century bishop who in the early second century, around 107, 110, was killed for his faith. And he writes these letters to the churches, imploring them to not stop his martyrdom because there was no greater honor than to be killed for Christ. I read that and I'm challenged. I read that and realize I'm a long way from that. But by God's grace, maybe I can keep moving towards that. Not that I'm trying to be killed for this, but that I could have such a mindset of that there is no greater gift than to suffer on behalf of Christ. This this isn't light. I get that. It's not always easy. It's not always fun talking about these things. But if we're going to rejoice in the joy of being united to Christ as counted as sons of God, well, then we also have to recognize that there's there's aspects of, hey, you're going to get treated like him. And ultimately, we'll be treated like sons of God in, in the new heaven and new earth. And what greater joy will there be than to be face to face at the at the marriage supper of God, to, to be united with all the believers and with Christ in that profound way for all of eternity. But in this life, it might not always be that pretty and that much of uh, a banquet, if you will. Well, there was a lot in this chapter, and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you can see how this begins to interact with your daily life, because this isn't just about having these nice thoughts and picking out fun quotes or finding fun facts about the Bible. As much as I love the Bible, that that, that isn't the point. The Bible it's not just, Bible knowledge isn't an end in and of itself, as good as it is. It is meant to conform us to Christ, to lead us in the path of salvation, following Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who is our salvation. So as we look at this, I think the clear call is to abide in the vine. And to, how do we do that? Well, we keep his commands. And what are his commands? It is to love him and to love as he has loved us to love our neighbor and greater love has no other than to lay down your life for his friends which jesus did we participate in and some of us well even follow in the footsteps of but even in that even when it's to the very end of our life we recognize that there's no greater joy than being united to christ there is no greater joy than being called a son of god there is no greater joy than going from servant to friend and here's the thing about that It's not that in going from servant to friend, we stop serving God, but we become a friend who serves. We are a servant called friend by the grace of God and who out of the overflow of the sheer grace of that, out of the wonder of being called friend of God, well, all we want to do is serve him because we know that there is no greater good than to serve him and to serve him will be to love him and to love our neighbor. Well, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope it inspires you to take the next step in your journey of following Jesus. If you enjoyed this, I'd really encourage you to hit subscribe and become a part of this community here at Gospel Simplicity. That would mean a ton to me. And if you want to become a patron, well, that's fantastic as well. In any case, until next time, stay on the lookout for more videos. And as always, go out and love God and love others, because truly above all else, that will change the world.